have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Well, tonight I want to begin with the main problem Jesus is dealing with in this passage. And I think if we can understand the problem, then the rest of the passage will come alive to us. And so here is the problem. It's that the Jewish leaders rejected the substance of John the Baptist and Jesus on the basis of the style by which the substance was communicated. So I'll repeat it. The Jewish leaders rejected the substance of John the Baptist and Jesus on the basis of the style by which the substance was communicated. Luke 7, 33 says this, for John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. So this is a reference to the, bap- or to the style of John the Baptist, that he did not come eating bread or drinking wine. That was his style. Conclusion, he's possessed by a demon. Then in verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating, eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so eating and drinking is in reference to the style by which Jesus communicated the gospel, and they came to a conclusion about who Jesus was through his style. They said he's, he's worldly, that Jesus is a friend of tax collectors and sinners, therefore he is worthy, therefore we should not listen to him. And so what Jesus is doing in this passage is that he is critiquing the leaders, the Jewish leaders of Israel, not only for rejecting him, but he is rebuking them for the basis by which they are rejecting him. He's saying, you guys have come to a place where you have rejected John the Baptist and myself, not because you don't think what we're saying is true, but you're rejecting us because of our style. And so Jesus is exposing the unreasonable nature of their unbelief. These Jewish leaders had heard Jesus teach and seen the power of Jesus. They, they had seen the miracles of Jesus, and yet they didn't believe. And so Jesus says, this isn't about, this isn't about whether or not what I'm saying is true. This isn't, this isn't what the issue is to you guys. You, you are disregarding John, and you're disregarding me on the basis of our style. And he says, that lacks integrity. It doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent at all. Let me give you an example of this. Now, this past week I was reading about uh, some different churches and how they're going about advertising to the world, inviting people into their church. And some of these attempts at advertisement I thought were pretty cool. They're creative. Uh, some of them were incredibly corny. Some of them were a giant failure. And some of, the, some of them were just plain weird. And so I'm going to show you a few of these here just to get your mind going. But here's the first attempt. It's of a small church in a small town that came up with this idea. They said, we're gonna, we, we gotta reach out to the community and we're having a lot of fun together as a small church. And so here's the signs, this is what the sign says, come join the fun. The only problem is that it's in front of a cemetery which is right next to the church. And so they didn't really think through where to put the sign and so I would say this is a big failure overall. Come join the fun in the cemetery, Church of the Walking Dead. And then. Um, There are other churches that rely heavily on their marquee advertisement outside of their building. And so I was reading about one church, they spend so much time and money and energy thinking about the little messages that go up on their sign. And I was reading about their strategy, and this is one that they put up that was responded to very well, honk if you love Jesus text while driving if you want to meet him. And they probably have a hundred of... Signs like this that don't have anything to do with the gospel, anything to do with the church, but they said this is what our strategy is for getting people's attention. Maybe they'll come check us out. Or there's a church on the West Coast, and uh, they said, we're going to do things really differently. We're going to draw new people into the church. And so if you come to one of their night services, you walk into the church, this is what you'll see. You'll see a table, and that's a glass of beer, beer and Bibles, and you can basically have 
uh, as many beers as you would like as long as you come to church. And this is an attempt to get people to come to church, which gave me an idea. So next week at the door, we're going to be passing out free marijuana for everyone who wants to attend, <laughs> just to bring people in. That's a joke. But I think, okay, okay, right, that's not really my style. Beers and Bible, that's not necessarily my style. But you look at the, the, the whole church world and all that different churches are doing in order to reach out to people, and there's incredible diversity. Some things are really cool, some things are really corny, some things are weird. But I want you to imagine for a second that someone is asked this question. They say, are you a Christian? And this person responds by saying, yes, I'm a Christian. Okay, why are you a Christian? And this person says, because my church gives out free beer, and I think that's cool. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Or imagine another scenario where someone says, hey, are you a Christian? This person says, no. Uh, okay, why are you not a Christian? Well, I'm not a Christian because I think marquee signs that have these messages are really stupid and dumb, and therefore, I'm not a Christian. In both situations, if these are the reasons why someone is a Christian or is not a Christian, it seems obvious that they're using the wrong criteria for evaluating the message of the gospel. So if someone's a Christian because their church hands out free beer, you say, that's not how you should make a decision about Christ. Or if you're not a Christian because you think the way churches advertise is stupid, that's not, that's not a good way to evaluate the message of the gospel. And what's going on in this passage is that Jesus is not just correcting the Jewish leaders for rejecting him. He's saying, you guys are using the wrong criteria. You're using a superficial criteria to evaluate our message. And he says, it's very damning. It's very destructive. Now, in this passage, there are three different parts that I, I think the text breaks into three different parts pretty naturally. And here are the three parts. The first is the setup, the second is the illustration, the third is the meaning. So let's start with the setup, verse 29. And when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been, been baptized by John's baptism. But since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. And so in verse 29, we begin to see the influence of John's baptism or John's message. It says that when all the people, including the tax collectors, that's a way of saying this. It's, it's a way of saying all the common folk. So all the common folk in Israel had been baptized by John. Now that's probably a little bit of a, of a stretch to say all of them. I mean, every individual, I don't think that's what Luke's getting at. I think he's getting at the scope of the influence that thousands upon thousands of people within Israel had been baptized by John's baptism. So he had a huge influence on the culture. And what the people agreed to believing about John is that he was a great prophet. That's, that's who he was. Some, some even believed that he was the prophet who was to come before the Messiah. And so what John the Baptist did is that he came preaching the message of repentance. He came preaching the message of sin, that people are sinners, that they're, 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 they're sinners before God and that God is going to judge the world and therefore you must repent. And people believed him. And they were baptized. They were deeply impacted by John's message. But Jesus says this about the response the people had to John the Baptist in John 5.35. Jesus says, John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So think about what that is saying. It's saying, Jesus is saying, there was this huge reaction to John the Baptist. Many people, thousands and thousands of people were getting baptized. They were responding to, to John's message. But Jesus says it's temporary. John 5, 35. You were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But Jesus knew that these same people who were baptized with John's baptism would turn against him. Now, at the height of John's ministry, Jesus comes onto the scene. Jesus begins his ministry, and, and John the Baptist tells all of his followers, go follow Jesus, that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And so it didn't make sense for John and Jesus to, to have a preaching ministry at the same time, at least for very long. They were overlapping for a little while, but what John the Baptist was doing was pointing everybody to Christ, saying, he's the Messiah, he's the one that you need to follow, he's the one that you need to believe in. 
And so as Jesus' ministry is starting and moving forward, John's ministry is tailing off. And we find John in Luke chapter 7 in prison awaiting his execution. Now you need to understand the problem that John the Baptist posed for the religious elite of the day, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. And the problem was that so many people had accepted John, even if it's superficial to some degree, they, they had accepted John the Baptist as a prophet. And the entire ministry of John the Baptist was pointing to Jesus. So if you accepted John the Baptist as a legitimate prophet, you had to accept Jesus. And if you accepted Jesus, then you had to accept John. And so they were a package deal. You couldn't just reject one without rejecting the other. And so what the Pharisees understood was that if they were going to maintain their power as the religious leaders of Israel, They couldn't just discredit John, or they couldn't just discredit Jesus. You have to discredit both of them. And so this is what we're seeing here, is that the Jewish leaders are moving to discredit both John and Jesus. And so the Jewish leaders are telling each other why they shouldn't believe in John and Jesus. And then this is the message that is spreading out to the people. So if you can imagine, you know, people were baptized by John. It's a semi-superficial repentance John's in prison and the people are wondering not only about who Jesus is, but who is John the Baptist. And so the Pharisees are communicating that you should not believe in John or Jesus. You shouldn't shouldn't believe in either of these guys. And so the natural question is this, why? What are the reasons? What reasons do you have as to why we should not believe in John and, and believe in Jesus? And so this is the setup to this passage, which leads to the assessment. We see Jesus's assessment of these Jewish leaders. Verse 31, to what then should I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? They are like children. We we can almost stop there. They are like children. That's what they're like. And not in a complimentary way. They are like spoiled brats. They are like little immature kids. This is his commentary on the Jewish people, particularly the leaders. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We sang a lament for you, but you did not weep. Now, many commentators have rightly noted that all throughout the ministry of Jesus, Jesus speaks very positively about kids. Luke 18 says this, Jesus, however, invited them, let the little children come to me and don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Uh, This is what Jesus repeatedly says. You need to become like a child. Do you want to enter the kingdom? Become like a child. He says, don't don't forbid the children from coming to me, but let them come to me. It says that Jesus loved the children. He loved these little kids. And so Jesus speaks very positively about children. But what is so positive about children? Why does Jesus speak so positively about children? Is it because children don't make mistakes? Is it because kids, kids don't make mistakes? Well, I have five kids, and I could tell you all night about how kids make mistakes, how they do things that are really dumb. Or I could just show you a few pictures real quick of kids doing dumb things. I just Googled picture, or kids making mistakes or something like that, and this is what came up. That's a picture of a kid who gave himself a haircut. He's cutting his hair in the bathtub in his undies. That's perfect. Or this kid made the same mistake, cutting his hair. Or this girl, instant regret, she's cutting her hair. And she knew it was not a good idea immediately. And I could, we could just talk about this all night. Kids make mistakes. And it's not that Jesus was blind to that reality. Not only do they mess up, but they sin. Children sin. So is that what Jesus is lifting up about children? I don't, I don't think so. I think what Jesus is lifting up about children in Luke 18 is the humility of children, the dependence of children, the openness of children. That's what he's lifting up. But Jesus also knew there was a side of children that's not good. That's why the Bible says we need to press on towards maturity. There there are childish things inside of us that we need to put away, that we need to be done with. And so when Jesus calls this generation and these leaders children, he's saying that these Pharisees and Jewish leaders are like foolish, ignorant, selfish, rebellious children who are playing a game. That's what they're like. Now, what is the game? Verse 31. 
To what then should I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament and you didn't weep. So this is what we need to picture in our mind. It's, a, it's just imagine a big open space at the center of a town. Uh, most towns had a big open space where you could bring your products to, to sell. Or it would be a place where people could gather for celebrations, concerts, public service announcements. Most towns had a big open marketplace right in the middle of the town. And so kids naturally, when they would gather together, they would play games. And there are two games being played. The first game is the flute or wedding game, verse 32. They're like children sitting in the marketplace calling out to each other, we played the flute for you. Now the flute is connected to happiness. The flute is connected to a celebration. Most commentator, or actually all the commentators I read this week said, Jesus is certainly talking about a wedding celebration here, that the game the kids are playing is a wedding game. Flutes were associated with this wedding procession. So you can imagine kids getting together and they are dividing up the responsibilities, the different roles when it comes to a wedding. Here's the bride, here's the groom, here's the bridal party, here's the flower, here are the flower girls or whatever, and they're playing the game. But there are, there are a group of kids who are standing off to the side with their arms folded, and they're saying, we're not playing this game. We're not going to play the happy game. That's, we're not going to do it. And then the other kids say, okay, why aren't you going to play the happy game? Well, we're too sad. We're just too sad to play the happy game. So we're done with the flute wedding celebration game. Okay. Kids say, all right, let's play a different game then. This is game number two. It's the lament. It's the funeral game. Weddings and funerals were the two times where a whole town would come together to weep and to celebrate. So this is the other end of the spectrum, the lament or the funeral game. So you imagine all the kids, they're, they're dividing up the roles again. You, you know, you're the pallbearer. I guess someone's playing the dead guy. I don't know how you play the funeral game, but someone's dead. And then you have the different roles that are being carried out. People are crying. That's what they're doing. But then the same kids that didn't want to play the happy game are folding their arms like this. We're not playing. Why aren't you going to play the sad game? We're too happy. Okay, so you're too sad to play the happy game, and you're too happy to play the sad game. That's right. Okay, so that's the image we should have in our mind. Kids in the marketplace, and they're just spoiled brat kids who cannot play. Now, how does this relate to anything? How does this relate to what Jesus is teaching? Well, here's the meaning. This is the third part. We have the setup, we have the assessment, and here's the meaning. Verse 33. For John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by all of her children. So this is how we connect. Jesus gave an illustration. Now he's going to explain the illustration. John the Baptist is the lament game. He's the funeral game. Verse 33. John the Baptist didn't come eating bread or drinking wine. That phrase, eating bread or drinking wine, is a summary statement to help us understand that John was not normal. To say eating bread and drinking wine is a picture of being included in the culture, in the mainstream, just normal relationships, but he didn't do that. He didn't come eating bread and drinking wine. He was kind of weird. That's the idea. He was socially an outcast. Let me show you you this from... The scriptures, scriptures. Luke 1.80 says this, the child grew up and became spiritually strong and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So John the Baptist, where did he grow up? <clears throat> where did he go once he had grown up? To the wilderness. That's where he lived. Not with people, he lived by himself in the wilderness. He was the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Or what about what he wore and what he ate. Matthew chapter 3 says, Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So what did he wear? What it means is, is that he didn't dress like everyone else. When it says he wore a camel hair garment, it means he didn't dress like everybody else. Camel hair was incredibly cheap because camels were everywhere. There was a type of camel hair that was processed 
that was expensive. But then there was a type of camel hair that was not processed and very cheap because it was incredibly uncomfortable. And the reason it was cheap was because camels were everywhere and camels molt. I didn't know this, but this is what they do. So here's a picture of a camel molting or... Here's the next one. Here's another camel. I mean, who wouldn't want to look like that? Who wouldn't want to wear that? So it was just everywhere. You could just get it and you could, without doing a lot. You didn't have to put it through a lot of processing. And so you could get it and you could wear it. But the idea is that he didn't dress like everybody else. He didn't look like everybody else. He didn't eat like everybody else. What was his food? Locust and wild honey. Now, this is weird when you think about this. Some people think, well, you know, it was 2,000 years ago. It was kind of normal. People just ate bugs, I guess. No, it was weird then. Unless you were starving to death, you wouldn't eat bugs. I mean, if, you, if that's your diet, how would you interact with people? Food and eating together is such a big part of the culture, and it was an even bigger part of the culture back then. I mean, could you imagine talking to someone? Hey, do you want to go get something to eat? Sure. What do you want to eat? Bugs. It's, it's just weird. We can dip them in honey and we'll, we'll call it good. But so it's a picture of isolation and separation from the main stream. Or what about his preaching? So, so John didn't live where everyone lived. He didn't dress like everyone dressed. He didn't eat like everyone ate. And he didn't preach like everyone preached. Luke chapter 3 says, Then he said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham, or for Abraham, from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And if you keep reading his preaching, you see that John, this is what John calls people. He calls people snakes. You brood of vipers, that means you're, you're a snake. Now, it doesn't matter how nice you sound when you say this. This is never a compliment. It's never a compliment to call someone a snake. Even, even when you're nice, you, man, that guy is such a snake. Like, it doesn't help it, really. It's, that's, that's never a compliment. And that's, who, that's, his, that's how he addresses his audience in verse 7. He said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Hi, snakes. You guys are snakes. These are his fans. And then he calls them chaff, about to be burned. You're like chaff. The wheat and the chaff separate. We just pick up the chaff and we light it on fire. That's who you guys are. That's what he said to the crowds. Or he says, you're like trees, about ready to be cut down and thrown into the fire. I mean, he, he preached a different type of message, and they hated it. Some people loved it. They heard it. And when they heard John's preaching, they were just honest. They were just honest with themselves. Because John was like, you guys are sinful. And some people said, you're right. But the Pharisees hated this message. They hated, they hated the message of grace. They hated the, the message of repentance. They hated the message of sin. They hated the idea of mercy. They wanted to earn their way to God. And so they rejected this message. And so what, what Jesus is addressing is how these people are discredit, discrediting John the Baptist. And how are they doing it? Verse 33, for John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine. They go after his style. His style was that he was a social outcast. He lived in the wilderness he didn't dress like everyone, didn't eat like everyone, didn't preach like everyone. He's an outcast, therefore he has a demon. Don't listen to him. And that is a strong statement for someone to make, to say he's actually possessed by a demon. Don't listen to him. How do they know he has a demon? Because he doesn't eat and drink. It's the only reason they would give. I mean, look at the guy. I mean, he's got bugs in his beard. He's got honey on his, on his face. I mean, who, what's, what's wrong with him? Of course he has a demon. But really the issue is they went after his style. But what about Jesus then? How do you discredit Jesus? Now remember, Jesus is perfect. 
You just, just let that sink for a moment. Just sink into your mind. Jesus is literally God in the flesh, perfect holiness, perfect righteousness. I mean, if Jesus had done anything different, it would have been less than perfect. I mean, if he would have said, no, I'm going to listen to you guys, I'm going to listen to the, to the advice of the Pharisees, it would have been horrible advice that would have sent him, down, sent him down a very destructive path. I mean, Jesus literally was and is the perfect man. And they're going to discredit Jesus. Now, what's, how are they going to discredit Jesus? Well, Jesus is the flute game. He's the wedding game. Verse 33, for John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. For the Son of Man, Jesus, has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus was very different than John the Baptist. He didn't grow up in the wilderness. He lived among the people. He dressed like everybody. He ate and drank. He was included in the culture. He was very mainstream. Maybe one difference was that Jesus was probably happier than John the Baptist. This is something that marked the ministry of Jesus was the fact that Jesus and his disciples celebrated. It says in Luke chapter 5, then he said to them, then they said to him, John's disciples fast often and say prayers, and those of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? So... The accusation, the indictment here is, Jesus, you and your disciples are too happy. You don't fast and you don't do what everyone else is doing. You're just like celebrating all the time. And Jesus says, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. And so the joy and the happiness of being around Jesus was a stumbling block to the Pharisees. They just couldn't handle how happy they were, how full of joy they were. Now, I want to be crystal clear. Jesus preached the exact same message as John the Baptist, except for John the Baptist preached the message of sin and repentance and pointed to Jesus, and Jesus preached the message of sin and repentance and pointed to himself. I mean, Jesus regularly went after the Jewish leaders in one message Matthew chapter 23, this is what Jesus says. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you look at how Jesus indicts the Jewish leaders, this is what he says in one message. He says, he he calls them hypocrites. He calls them blind fools. He calls them greedy. He calls them selfish. He calls them whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look good. Inward, you're full of dead bodies. He calls them sons of Satan, condemned to hell. He calls them snakes. He calls them chickens. Calls them Hawkeye fans, which I thought was weird. I'm just joking. It's football season. I'm sorry. Just started. But he goes after these guys, and he condemns these people. So Jesus preached a very strong message, the same message as John the Baptist, except for Jesus was a little bit happier. He was a much. He was happy. People were full of joy being around Jesus. So how are you going to discredit Jesus? If you discredited John, saying he's demon-possessed because he doesn't eat and drink, then how are you going to discredit Jesus? Verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and eventually they say he's demon-possessed. This is what Jesus is reacting to. So this is the way it works. In verse 33, don't listen to John because he doesn't eat and drink. Verse 34, don't listen to Jesus because he does eat and drink. You see the problem? It doesn't make any sense. It's superficial. He's like, you've got to make up your mind. You can't tell, you can't tell everyone that John, don't listen to John because he doesn't eat and drink, and you can't tell them... Everyone else, don't listen to me because I do eat and drink. you got to make up your mind. This lacks incredible intellectual integrity. There's no substance. And so as I've been studying this passage this week, I've been thinking, okay, so this is what's going on in the passage. What do we do with it? 
What do we do with these verses? Well, I have a couple application points that I hope will try to draw these things together. Number one is this, is that if you're going to reject Jesus, reject Jesus because you don't think he's real, not because you don't like what he says. So I don't know everyone here tonight, and I'm assuming there are a number of you who are not Christians, but I would encourage you, if you're going to reject Jesus, reject his offer of forgiveness and reconciliation, if you're going to reject his gift of eternal life, I would encourage you to reject him because you don't think he's real. You don't think he is who he says he is. Not because, don't reject him because you don't like what he says. See, what the Pharisees did lacked any form of integrity because they were inconsistent with their own standards. Don't listen to John because he doesn't eat and drink. Don't listen to Jesus because he does eat and drink. And what Jesus is bringing to the surface in this passage is the reality that the, Pharise- the root issue was that the Pharisees simply did not like the message. They didn't have any real reasons for objection. They, had no, they, they couldn't make an argument against what was being said. And so they simply said, we don't like what is being said, and then we're going to appeal to the style of these people in order to disregard them. But Jesus says that's just silly. You can't actually live your life that way. Don't live your, that doesn't make any sense. You know, imagine if you went to the doctor and the doctor says, I have really bad news for you. The bad news is that you have cancer. Now imagine if you responded to that doctor by saying this, I don't like that news, therefore it is not true. I don't like that news because it would inconvenience my life too much. It'd be too disruptive to my life. Therefore, I'm rejecting that news. You would say, no, that's not the right way to evaluate anything. Don't evaluate anything that way. Really, the only question that matters is, is the doctor right? Is the doctor telling the truth? Because if you have cancer, you need to deal with it. If you don't have cancer, disregard what's being said. But don't disregard what's being said because you don't like the news, because you feel like it's gonna change your life too much. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were saying to the people, because John and Jesus were going around preaching the message of sin and the need for repentance and the need for, for the mercy of God. But what the Pharisees were doing is don't listen to John the Baptist. Don't listen to John the Baptist because of the style. It would be like this in that analogy. It would be like the Pharisees saying to you, hey, um, don't listen to the doctor who told you you have cancer because that doctor has long hair. She has long hair. You need to go to a different doctor. So you go to a different doctor who has short hair, and that same doctor says, you have cancer. And then the Pharisees say, Don't listen to the doctor that says you have cancer because she has short hair. You'd say, what's that have to do with anything? So the fact that someone has long hair or short hair does not influence or impact the reality of having cancer or not. You'd say, that just doesn't make it. You shouldn't live, you can't live your life that way. And that is exactly, that is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. Don't listen to John, because John eats and he drinks, or he doesn't eat and drink. Don't listen to Jesus, because he eats and drinks. I think Jesus is saying, what does that have to do with anything that I'm saying? It doesn't influence whether or not it's true that you're a sinner in need of grace. And I think so many people in our culture today They reject the gospel simply because they don't like the message. That's why they reject it. What are your reasons? So like if you're here tonight, I would just, and you're not a Christian, you've rejected Christ, I would say, why? Why have you rejected him? Is it simply because you don't like the message? Some people say the gospel isn't inclusive enough. Or, I've had many people tell me this, following Jesus would change my life too much. It's impractical. Or Christianity or the gospel says that I'm sinful and that doesn't make me feel very good. 
And I think none of those things matter at all when you're trying to figure out whether or not Jesus really is who he says he is. And so let me ask you, if you're not a Christian, if you've rejected Christ, why have you rejected him? Why have you denied his offer of life and forgiveness? See, there is great offense in the preaching of the gospel. There's a great offense that is attached to actually saying what God says is true about you. But there's a great offer of life and forgiveness and joy. I mean, that's what Jesus is, is after. Jesus is, he's after your life. He's after your joy. He wants you to know real life. He wants you to have rivers of living water flowing from within you. He, he wants you to to follow him and to know him. He wants you to experience the reality of God, to fulfill the purpose for which you've been created, which is to know him and to bring glory to his name. But you'll never know that reality until you can feel the weight of the bad news of the gospel. And that's what the Pharisees could not accept. They just couldn't accept what Jesus and John were saying. I mean, this, is, this was the message that was being preached. What Jesus preached was this, is that whether you are religious or irreligious, whether you are a prostitute or you are a prophet or a priest or a pastor, everyone is equally worthy of hell. That's what John and Jesus preached. It doesn't matter who you are. You are equally worthy of hell because you've sinned and no one has forced your hand. By your own choice, you've, you've chosen to sin. You've chosen to lie. You've chosen to steal. You've chosen to be immoral, sexually immoral. You've chosen to rebel against God. Whether you are a priest or you're a prostitute, and so Jesus and John said, listen, it doesn't matter who you are, Pro if you're a prostitute or a prophet, Everyone has an equal need for grace and forgiveness because everyone is a sinner. So whether you're the Pope or you're Osama bin Laden, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to be saved, if you want to be transformed, if you want to know God, if you want to be reconciled, if you want to know life, you have to go through the same process. And that process is repentance. See, what the Pharisees had done, just think about this for a moment, what the Pharisees had done was this, is that they had grabbed a really big ladder. Just imagine like the biggest ladder you could find. And they put it up against this building toward, or called religion. And what the Pharisees were doing is that they had spent their life climbing, going up, 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 climbing this ladder on the wall of religion, and their thinking is that what I need to do to get to God is just keep climbing, keep climbing, keep climbing. I need to keep memorizing the Torah. I need to keep going to the synagogue. I need to keep being a good person. I need to make sure I don't have bad friends. I need to do all this stuff. And their whole life was totally devoted to climbing this ladder. And what they believed was that at the very top of the ladder was God. That's how you know him. That's how, you, that's how you have a relationship with him. That's how you earn your way to God is that you work really hard climbing this ladder. But what Jesus preached and what John the Baptist preached is this, is that in order for the Pharisees to know God, they would have to come all the way down from that ladder and start all over. What Jesus preached is this, is that you Pharisees, the fact that you've devoted your life to being religious doesn't bring you one inch closer to knowing God. And so if the Pharisees were going to follow Jesus, if they were going to leave everything behind, that meant they had to leave their whole religious system behind, and that would have been so disruptive to them. It would have been so disruptive to their inner world because now they couldn't justify judging everyone, sitting on top of everybody, looking down at everybody. They couldn't justify the idea that I have earned my way to God. They couldn't do that anymore. What they had to say is I'm no better than a prostitute. And so it was a message of great humility. And not only did they have to come down from the ladder and start all over, they had to look to a person. 
They had to look to the person of Jesus Christ. That's what John preached. Behold the Lamb of God. He pointed everybody to Christ. You gotta look to a person and you gotta look to the work of this one person who's better than you. That's what the Pharisees would have heard. The, the message is Jesus is better than you. He actually has lived a perfect life. That Jesus Christ has lived a sinless, spotless life. He never did one thing wrong. If anyone in the history of the world has earned a relationship with God, it's Jesus. If, if anyone in the world has ever earned or a, a reconciliation, a right relationship with God, it is Jesus Christ. And so what you have to do, Pharisees, come down from your ladder and then look to the person of Jesus Christ and more specifically, look to the cross of Christ. That the reason Jesus went to the cross was because my sin, your sin, demands death. Don't you know that? Don't you already know that? Isn't there something inside of you when you sin, you, you violate your conscience, you do what you know is wrong? Isn't there a sense like, man, there should be a punishment? That's why there's guilt and shame. It's not because the culture is breathing down your neck. It's because your very conscience condemns you. You know, you know what I have done deserves some sort of punishment. And because of that punishment, because of the love of God, Jesus went to the cross. And the punishment that all of us deserve was put on him. Jesus looked at you. I mean, if you could imagine all the sins that you've committed, if you could imagine carrying them, your lust that's wreaked havoc in your world, carrying it, your pride, carrying it, your greed, your hatred, your bitterness. Can you just imagine carrying all those things? And what Jesus preached is that those things that you know you have demands death. And what Jesus has done for each one of us is he's come up to us and he says, give me those things. I'll carry them. And that's what he was doing at the cross. So he, was, he was taking the burden of our sin. He was taking the guilt and the shame of our sin against God. And then the wrath that you justly deserve, that I justly deserve, was, was turned away from us and it was zeroed in on Christ at the cross. And then Jesus, with joy in his heart over what God would do through the cross, he bore the burden and he died in our place. And so what the Pharisees would have to do is come down from the ladder, start all over, and look to the person of Jesus Christ. And that was too disruptive for them. That would change their life too much and they didn't want it. And so they rejected him. And so I would encourage you, if you are not a Christian, if you're going to reject Jesus and his offer, that I mean, Jesus, Jesus came here for us. That's why he came. He came because what we carry demands death. And he says, I'm taking it from you. He came to carry our sin and die our death. And he offers you life and forgiveness. He offers you reconciliation. And if you're going to reject that, I would encourage you to reject it by saying, I just don't think he is who he says he is. Not because you don't like what he says. That would be the first application. The, the second is this, is look at how John and Jesus were treated by the culture. Now this is not, the, I just want to be clear, this is really not the main point of the passage, but I can't help but notice this. L look at how John and Jesus were treated by the culture. So who, who's John the Baptist? Jesus tells us in Luke 7, he's the greatest man who ever lived. That's who John the Baptist is. Okay, who's Jesus again? He's literally the only perfect person who's ever lived. I mean, he literally everything he did was perfect. And what was the response by the religious culture? John has a demon. 
and Jesus needs to die. Boy. When I read that, I, I, it just helps me. It, it, it helps me to think about how if we're going to be followers of Christ, we, we have to learn to put our feet someplace. And where we need to put our feet is in God's word. And the place we stand is, is where God tells us to stand. And the things that we say are the things that God tells us to say. And what will happen when you do that is that not just the Gentile unbelieving world, but the religious world will come knocking. That's what is going to happen. Now, you might make great friends with religious people and Gentiles. You might have that experience. I'm sure you have. But I just think in our souls, we just need to look at that. And I think we could probably talk for hours about what that means, but we just need to notice that. So if someone, you hear about somebody, someone's looking at someone and says, that guy is bad, maybe think about it before you accept it. Maybe think about it. I mean, how do you think Jesus, if Jesus was the pastor of our church and he said what Jesus said, how do you think he would be treated? How do you think John the Baptist would be treated? How do you think he would be treated in the culture? Well, John was beheaded and Jesus was crucified. And so again, I'm not going to try to flesh out all the ways that this might apply, but I do think it's helpful for us just to notice it. So that if, if we ever find ourselves in a position where we're just preaching the same gospel message that John preached and Jesus preached, if we find ourselves in a position where people are coming at us, we should say we're in good company. We're in good company. That is not a battle cry to go pick fights with the world and the religious world, to be clear. But it's just to help us understand, this is like just what happens. This is just the world we live in. You stand for what God says to stand for, and you're going to get it from the religious world and the non-believing world. And so take courage. Make sure you know where your feet are at. Make sure you know what God's word actually says, and say what God says, and, and trust him. And if that helps you to make great friends, praise God. And if people say you have a demon, praise God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for your example. Just the, the example of being absolutely fearless. Lord, I, I just... you the courage that you had to take on people who are actually trying to kill you, Lord. I just don't even know how you did that. To speak the truth to the people who are plotting your death is just, it's too much for me. And I just, I want to pray for this room of people. Lord, we have people all that are all over the board. Some really love you. Some don't know you. Some hate you. And, and I just, I pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes, uh, that your Holy Spirit would help us to see our sin and help us to see our need for forgiveness. Help us to see your mercy. Lord, that your, your mercy is what we need. Your forgiveness is what we need. I, I pray for the Pharisees here tonight who think they're too good. I, I pray they would walk down the ladder and they would look to you. Help them to see that that religious ladder will never get us to God. The only way to God is through you, Jesus. And so we just... Just ask that you would help us to see you. Help us to be full of love and mercy. And help us to be courageous. Help us to say what you tell us to say.
Help us to stand where you tell us to stand. Help us to worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.